guidance essentials. This is like, so this is an intro to early childhood education class. So every like lecture that we've done, every chapter of this book is a whole course in itself. <laughs> so um, when I teach at Parkland, I don't teach the observation and assessment class, but it's a whole class, right? So at whatever stage you are in your career or in your school experience, all of this should be sort of just like the tip of the iceberg learning about this stuff. And then there's way more stuff that goes along with it. But as an intro class, we just try to like pack the, you know, eight or 10 most important topics into the class and then hope that you will, you know, do in-depth courses on all of these things later on. Make sense? <laughs> okay, so guidance, discipline, and punishment. This is actually, I teach um, socialization and guidance for the young child, and it's one of my favorite classes to teach because this is what we spend a lot of our time doing, right? We spend a lot of time trying to figure out children's behavior, how to guide their behavior, how to prevent their behavior. Um, social emotional development and behavior stuff is like a huge part of early childhood. And so this is um, important stuff. And like I said, we're not going to cover it nearly in as much depth here as you will later on, hopefully, in your life. So guidance is the system of strategies to help children learn to manage impulses and express their feelings and channel their frustrations and solve their problems and learn acceptable versus unacceptable behavior. This is what you're doing every day, right? You are guiding all the time. Discipline is the ability to follow an example or follow rules, the development of self-control, everything adults do and say to influence children's behavior is discipline. And then there's positive guidance and positive discipline. And you should be doing both of those things all the time with children. And then punishment, which is a consequence for inappropriate behavior and punishments should be very rare. So discipline and guidance is what you should do. This is about you helping children understand what they should should do, what they are expected, what um, example, giving them examples to follow, giving them um, very uh, explicit instructions about the kind of behavior that you want to see. Um, it's an ongoing process. It helps guidance and discipline helps children develop self-control. If they know what's going to happen next, if they know what's going to, um, um, what's expected of them, then they will do those things. Um, it's positive. It gives them the ability to think through things. Like I know that um, you want to run around in the classroom, but I've set up the classroom in such a way that you need to stop and think about, is that the right thing to do? Um, discipline helps build self-esteem because children get to make their own choices. And when they make good choices, it's a good thing and it shapes their behavior. So this is authorita authoritative, right? You are the authority and you are sharing your authority and your expectations with them, okay? Punishment is should be very, very rare and it emphasizes what children should not do, right? It should be, it, um, it insists on obedience, it undermines independence. Punishment is often an adult release. Like I'm so angry at you that I have to do this thing to feel better about the way that you're behaving, um, right? It's negative, it makes children behave. It doesn't give them choices about what to do. It, lowers their self-esteem and it condemns misbehavior. It's authoritarian. You are in charge. You are making the rules. The child doesn't have any choice here. And so often children get punished for things that they didn't really understand or mean to do, right? Um, 
one of my teachers always used to say that, and she worked with crazy three-year-olds, that they weren't giving her a hard time, they were having a hard time. So their behavior was because they were lacking something or they didn't understand something. So why would you punish a kid for not having what they need or not understanding what they're supposed to do? Um, that's why it's important that we look at what they're doing and think about why is this child doing this thing? What can I give them to help prevent that behavior? What do they need? What do they not understand? Um, temperament. So there are three types of children, apparently, easy, difficult, and slow to warm up. Um, yes, and I think it's really difficult to just sort kids into three types, like, <laughs> oh, you're easy, and oh, you're difficult, right? Children have easier times with some things and more difficult times with other things. Slow to warm up, yeah, I think a lot of kids are slow to warm up. So. Um, Yes, there are children that you understand their temperament by dealing with them, observing them over time, and you know what motivates them, what makes them tick, and how to work with them. Um, family patterns and cultures influence guidance and discipline, right? So the way that you are dealt with in your family is going to impact the way that you behave in the classroom. If you have adults that yell at you at home, you are going to maybe expect that unless you get yelled at at school, you can do whatever you want. So um, it's interesting to think about how children behave at school and wonder how, what is their parental guidance or their family guidance at home like, right? And sometimes you can impact that you can say to parents, well, we've noticed that um, um, Lucy is really quick to cry when someone um, looks at her the wrong way. And we wonder if, what are the things that we can do to help her not, you know, not be so sensitive about things? What works for you at home? And you can also find out by doing that sometimes things that aren't working well at home and try to help encourage parents to do the right thing. Um, so these are some different types of family cultures, democratic family me members share in decision-making, authoritarian one member, one family member makes all of the decisions. And it doesn't always have to be dad making all the decisions. It could be mom making all the decisions or grandma making all the decisions. And that can cause some, you know, stress on a family. Um, a strong, close-knit family, honor, dignity, and pride, expressing feelings is accepted. Some families are criers and yellers and, you know, kids then model that behavior at school. Some families are not, you know, you don't express any emotions. And so you need to understand, and we'll talk about this, I think, next week a little bit, how, what's the family dynamic and how can you understand how a child's behavior is affected by that? Um, so if you are dealing with a child who comes from an authoritarian family, um, that child may not be able to act independently, may not be able to choose activities to do, may have a hard time um, thinking for themselves. So what do you do? You help them try to do that at school, right? Oh, you know, a child whose parents always um, zip their coats up and put their backpacks on for them. Encourage them to try to do those things. Help them understand that they're capable, even if their parents might not. Um, sometimes what happens is authoritarian parents do everything because they don't understand that a child is capable of doing it. And so your job is to help parents understand, you know what, your child could do this thing. And it, it's important for you to allow them the space and the time. Time is often a reason why parents do everything for their kid because they're in a hurry to get things done and get in the car and go to that place. Sometimes you just have to step back and be okay with being a few minutes late because 
Joey needs to put his shoes on by himself or, you know, um, I think one, one thing I did learn with zoom was that, uh, being remote that we were actually teaching the parents how to be, um, better with their children more than we were actually teaching the children, um, and how to, um, do an activity the way we would do it in our classroom for them to be able to understand it a little better. And it really brought the teachers and the parents together a lot more. It was very, very reassuring all the time about, they were very willing to share yeah. more ideas with us of what they're doing at home as well. That's excellent. And that is one good thing. Uh, one of my um, teachers that I know was like, I teach in everybody's house now. So I know what is going on, you know, before they were with me, I didn't know what was going on in their house. And now I, I have some, some better perspective of what, what their life is like. Um, okay. So these are some guidance strategies that you can learn from, and that this is all from your book. So I'm going to go, um, Okay, inductive guidance is helping children develop their reasoning and problem solving skills. So it, this is guidance where you are inducing the behavior or the, um, the ideas or whatever that you want. So you're asking open-ended questions, you're providing appropriate choices, you're telling kids that you trust them and you have confidence in them and you know that they can do this. You are... Um, Modeling your guidance is an interactive process. I'm going to help you do this thing, right? We're going to work on this together. Um, but then moving toward independence and having them be responsible for things. This is what we should be doing, right? We should be helping children become independent and make their own decisions and have their own choices and think about things. Indirect guidance is the stuff that we talked about last week with um, the environment. This is guidance that you are providing for children that is not things that you're saying to them. This is how we're setting up the schedule of the class, how we are putting the furniture in the classroom. We're guiding their behavior by doing these things. And we talked about that a lot last week when we talked about curriculum, right? In addition to that, um, it also, or environment, it also is how you work together with the kids. What is the community that you've developed? This is also guidance, indirect guidance. How am I working with all the children in my classroom and my fellow teachers? This is one of my favorite things. This is the um, direct guidance continuum. So this is when you have a behavior that you just don't want a child to be doing in the classroom, what is the continuum of how you deal with that? So the first thing is, first, you wanna think about why is this child doing this behavior and then act accordingly, provide whatever guidance fits. But what you might do first is just ignore the behavior. Sometimes the behavior is just to get your attention. And if you ignore it, it will go away. If it's not fun anymore, it will go away. Next is listening. Like I see what you're doing. I understand that you're upset about this. What can we do to change your behavior? What can we do to help you not feel so angry or I know what's going on. I'm here to help you. We need to work on this together. So they know that you're involved. Um, positive reinforcement. When you see a good behavior, um, praise it specifically. Or if you have a bad behavior happening, you can also remember when you didn't do that. <laughs> remember when you weren't pounding on your friend with a Lego and I told you how great it was that you were getting along. Remember how good that felt? So taking them back to positive reinforcement to get them out of the negative behavior that you're seeing. Redirection and distraction. This one is you know, sort of one of the most important things that you can do. When you see a behavior that's happening and you don't want that behavior to continue, 
redirect and distract, right? Hey, what's going on over there? That can shut down a tantrum or that can shut down a bad behavior pretty quickly. Um, giving choices. You can continue to um, stand and kick the rug or we could go, you could help me get snack ready. What would you like to do? Sometimes they're gonna continue to stand and kick the rug because that's what they need to do then, right? And that's okay. And then you say, okay, if this is the thing that you need to do, I'm gonna stand here for three minutes while you do that. And then we're gonna move on to the next thing, which would be setting limits, right? You can do this thing for two more minutes and then we've got to move on. Um, active problem solving and conflict resolution. If you've ever been in a class of you know, three or four year olds who are fighting about something that you don't even really understand or know about, active problem solving and conflict resolution can be anything that you can think of to move them to something else, right? So it could be, you know, you know, one of um, the old tried and trues is, oh, everyone's fighting over the dinosaur. You know what? We're going to need to put the dinosaur away for a little bit until everybody can play together better, right? Um, and especially with you know, twos and threes who are fighting over a thing, it's better to just remove the thing than to say, okay, it's so-and-so's turn right now. And this depends on the severity of the altercation, but a lot of times it's easier to, and easier for kids to understand if nobody can have it than to have somebody gets to have it and I have to wait my turn to have it that's kind of like insult and injury at the same time. Like we were fighting over it and then you get it and I don't have it and I have to wait. So sometimes it's better to just like disappear the whatever it is for a few minutes and then distract everybody and move to something else. So this isn't just, this guidance continuum isn't just try this one. Oh, if that one doesn't work, try this one. Oh, if that one doesn't work, try this one. It's literally like, what are the three things that I can do together to get this situation under control? Timeout, we don't like timeouts, right? Timeouts don't do much. Timeouts distract and they stop a behavior, but it doesn't teach anybody anything. Just putting a kid in timeout doesn't tell them why they're in timeout or what they should have been doing instead of what they did to get in timeout, right? Now, if you have a child who is you know, clearly having an issue, having a tantrum, beating up another kid, you need to remove that child before he hurts himself or someone else, right? And maybe it's not a timeout, maybe it's a reset, maybe it's a, hey, come sit with me for a little bit so we can talk about what's going on. With younger kids, it's, it's more of a stop the activity, let's find something else to do. With older kids, you can say, look, we need to just stop that because this is what was happening. That's not a behavior that we do in our classroom. What do we do instead? Have that child help you figure out what's the thing that they should be doing, right? Timeouts and then physical intervention. Physical intervention is obviously only if the child is harming themselves or about to harm someone else, right? And then you stop that and you know, all of these need to have an element of why am I stepping in here, right? Explaining to the child, this was not going right. And I needed to help you figure out how to do the right thing, how to do the thing that we do in this classroom. Okay. Ah, I think that's it. That was a short one. Like the fact that I think I can teach you how to like deal with a three or, or you know zero to five or zero to eight behavior in eight slides. <laughs> These are all things you just have to live through to really understand and know that the thing you know the thing that worked really really well with that one kid probably not going to work with somebody else, right? You could be in exactly the same situation in exactly the same classroom with, you know, exactly the same time of day. And you'll go, oh, I remember what I did. I put the toy away 
and everybody was fine. And then that time it's not going to work. Something else is going to be the thing that you need to do. And one of the best things that I think is when you figure out um, what works with that kid. Um, we used to have, we had a four-year-old who was super smart kid and would just get so frustrated that he would just rage. And it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily triggered by any specific thing that we could figure out. It was just like rage. And he, what we did was we would just sort of have to remove him from the classroom. And he never had a problem rem being removed from the classroom. Um, and so what he would do was he would come sit in my office and I had an extra computer and he was super duper smart. And so he would come sit at the computer and do whatever he was doing. And then he would, you know, when he got through whatever his feelings were and whatever was upsetting him, he could go back to the classroom. And so his, um, and we talked it over with the parents, is this okay? You know, cause you don't wanna remove a child. It sort of puts them in, it, it singles them out in a way, but you know, the other children in the classroom were often kind of scared when he was having these like rage fits. And so we, we said to the parents, is it okay if we do this? And they said, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever you think will work. And what we noticed was after a while, he wouldn't have the rage, but he would just show up in my office. And he would know when he was starting to feel really frustrated or really angry about something that removing himself and finding something else to do would be, would help him. So he would say, you know, he, he'd like say to Miss Jennifer, Miss Jennifer, I have to go talk to Miss Amy. And he'd show up in my office and I'd be like, hey, Brandon, Brandon, are you having a rough time? And he'd say, yeah, and he'd sit down at my computer or his, com his computer. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd work there for a little bit next to each other. And then all of a sudden he'd say, okay, thanks for letting me hang out. And he'd go back to his classroom. And, you know, that's a super valuable skill that he learned. He taught himself, like, I know when I've gotten to the end of my line here and I have a, um, a way of controlling it, right? And so giving kids the, this guidance continuum in a way, helping them understand that is as important as you being able to do the thing. You know what I mean? So like, as you are working with a child who's having a behavior issue, you need to be telling them, we're going to try this thing because I think this might help you feel better and help make you less angry. What if we did this? Even with, you know, littler kids, threes, you can still do this. It doesn't, they may not get the whole thing, but if you reinforce that this is a behavior that we don't do in the classroom, but this is a behavior that you can do instead of it, that will be so helpful for them as they go through life. Like that's, a, that is um, a social emotional skill. It's, it's really sort of executive function um, and self-control, right? You're teaching them. And that is so useful in the rest of their lives. So if you can sort of start that process when they're real little, it comes in real handy forever.